Good afternoon. This is Melanie Bluegrass for Abolition News Network. Today is July 1st, 1864, and we are riding on the New York City IRT subway. Uh, today we're following a story regarding New York City and its relationship with the cotton and slave trading south. Uh, here to give us his uh, opinion on this and, and, and New York City's stance is the mayor of New York. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, please welcome Fernando Wood. Uh, Mayor Wood, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you, Ms. Bluegrass, on the Abolition News Network. So I can explain how New York City fits into the cotton business. Well, great. We would love to hear your point of view on this. Now, I'd like to start off by talking about an article that was in the uh, New York Times. Uh, it was on uh, J January 8th, 1861, and in it, uh, it states that uh, you reported to the New York City Council that due to the disillusion of the Union, you felt that you, New York City should declare its own independence, breaking away from both the South and the North, uh, to further enhance your ability to trade with the slave-owning South. Uh, to a lot of people, this seems drastic. It's not at all drastic. Southern trade and slavery have been the foundation of the city's booming economy, with the city and the South tightly bound together. With the South leaving the Union, I envision other sections will follow and multiple independent nations will be established. For instance, the Independent Trading Republic, consisting of Long Island, Staten Island, and Manhattan. And, uh, national disruption might just be a blessing in disguise for New Yorkers. New York would be a free city or an open city. And uh, prior allegiance to the Republican-controlled state of New York would be severed. Going to see the governor about that now. Peaceful secession is to me a passing state of Southern anger. Southern grievances are justified. All right, uh, so what about the Union, the United States of America? Isn't that important to you? Yes, partially, but the nation I envision is a slaveholding nation with unchanged pre-war institutions. You see, I am in the middle ground of this. I am a peace democrat. This is a government of white men, and it is established exclusively for the white race. The Negro race is not in equal political or social equality with white men. My name is Jane Flum, and I'm a receptionist for a &M. The New York Times were right when they said you were declared enemy of the administration and a known sympathizer with the rebels, ready to make with them under their terms at the first chance. You are a traitor to the United States of America. Ms. Flum, you're antagonizing our guest. Um, Mayor, she does have a point there. Where do you stand with the rebels? It is the business side of this that everyone is forgetting about. I'd like you to hear me out. Sure, sure. We'd love to hear what you have to say. You see, the Chamber of Commerce of the State of New York in its annual report in 1859 I noted how uh, New York bankers and merchants financed the European-bound cotton trade. In this chart, you can see that Europe's weekly cotton consumption went from 18,900,000 pounds in 1850 to 25,400,000 pounds just before the war. And here you can see that the total cotton exports of the United States went from over 124 million pounds in 1820 
to 1 billion 372 million pounds in 1860. That's going from a value of 20 million dollars to over 161 million dollars. I'd say as a result of New York financing, southern planters owe northern merchants and bankers and shippers 200 million dollars. You see, we are part of an industry with slavery and cotton together, worth three billion dollars in 1860. That's more than the combined value of all the factories, railroads, and banks in all of the United States of America. I understand that there is a significant financial gain to slavery, um, but what a, do you agree with the president that the the main goal is to keep the Union together. Not exactly. When President Lincoln was first elected, I had a reception for him at the New York City Hall. I asked him to allow New York to be an open city and to compromise to avoid war because political division affects the city and endangers its commercial greatness. I asked him to restore fraternal relations between the states by peaceful and conciliatory means. He surprised the crowd by agreeing with me and promising a policy that would not harm the city or the nation provided the Union could be preserved. Now look where we are. I urge all Americans to preserve the Union and vote for General George McClellan in the next election. As far as your idea goes, that New York secede from the North and become an open city so that you can trade with your southern friends, I think that you should have open sewers so the President can smell your stinking plant. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Flum and Mayor Wood, for your honest opinions. There you have it, the politics of New York, invested in cotton, slavery, and the European market. I guess the Civil War is here to stay, at least for now. This is Melanie Bluegrass for Abolition News Network, saying good afternoon. Volumes 1 through 10, on the road to the abolition of slavery.